Really excited about today's show because if any of you have listened to my former podcast dating back to 2018, maybe the Dan Cave Show, maybe the Emerald City Sportscast, you've heard today's guest, Eric Briggs, a longtime dear, dear friend of mine, also one of the most knowledgeable Seahawk fans that I've ever known. We're going to talk combine. We're going to talk free agency, get you set for the start of the new league year in just a week or so. Eric Briggs joining me today on Seahawks Forever. Welcome to the Seahawks Forever podcast, in-depth analysis on everything Seahawks. And now here's your host, Dan Viennes. So we're going to touch on it today, but uh, if you want a more in-depth analysis of whether or not the Seahawks may be looking to move up in the draft to take a franchise quarterback in the draft next month, uh, check out the latest show. I also went back historically and looked at some other trades up from teams looking for franchise quarterbacks, trying to ascertain whether or not uh, it might be cost prohibitive for the Seahawks or what it might take for them to move up and do that. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Seahawks Forever. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that like button, the bell notification, or the bell button so you get notifications on all future episodes and subscribe to the channel on audio platforms. If you listen on Spotify, you can subscribe for less than a dollar a month and listen to ad free exclusive episodes just for you. And if you want to just buy me a beer or a coffee, you can do so at the link in the description as well. Let's get right into this. Here's my conversation today on all things combine free agency Seahawks off season with my good friend, Eric breaks. It has been way too long since I have had today's guest on the show with me. In fact, it wasn't this show. He's never been on Seahawks forever. I think the last time you and I spoke in any kind of recorded fashion, it was maybe the Emerald City Sportscast. But long time, dear friend, long time friend, and uh, friend of many of my past shows. Let's put it that way. Eric Briggs joining me now. Eric, it's about time we got you back on the show. Happy to be here. Happy to be here. Took a minute to get we, we had to get him set up with some equipment. Had to get all his 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 stuff together. Yes. And uh and here we are. We're going to talk about some Seahawks offseason. Let's do it. Uh and uh as much as some of you have come to expect uh guest appearances by my many cats. Um uh there may be some dogs making an appearance or at least voicing their opinion tonight a, a time or two. 100% that will happen. Yes. <laughs> All right, let's uh Excuse me. Let's get into this. Uh, we're going to talk. We're going to review the combine. I want to get your thoughts on guys that really stood out to you that you see as Seahawk fits or that kind of make you drool a little bit. Maybe some guys uh, on both sides of the ball, maybe some guys that disappointed you that you were expecting more out of and sort of how you view the next month or so of this offseason going for the Seahawks based on what you've seen so far with the new staff. But I can't talk to you or anybody about anything Seahawk related today without bringing this up. Uh, the, the Broncos made it official today. They're releasing Russell Wilson on the 13th of March. Um, interestingly enough, he wrote a long glowing goodbye to the city of Denver and the Denver organization, um, which Seahawk fans were quick to screenshot next to the six word goodbye that he penned almost two years ago to the day when he was uh, traded away by the Seahawks. Just your thoughts on, uh, how that that whole thing went down two years later. It's amazing how time flies and where both organizations kind of sit as a result of that trade. I mean, honestly, regardless of how it ended, I thought the Russell Wilson trade was a great trade. Even let's say Denver would have won the Super Bowl this year. We needed to reset the team. We needed talent at some positions, offensive line, cornerback. like, And we were able to do a lot of that because of that trade. Now, obviously with how bad they played and getting the better picks year two was, you know, icing on the cake. Yeah. I don't, I, I take no joy that it ended the way it did for Russell and Denver. Like I was definitely as a fan ready to move on and see what we could do by putting money and draft picks into the positions of need and how that would then affect the overall team performance for sure. I had gotten really tired of, you know, Russell, the Russ Cook and all that stuff. Like it wasn't the guy that we drafted that played within the system that then because of his athletic ability would make special plays on 
you know, situations where things had broken down, but it was, you know, all about the team. It was all about just getting the victory. It was all about us getting to the championship and trying to win it. And I don't feel that was the same mood overall the last three, four years he was with us. Um, so I, I, again, if the Broncos would have won a Super Bowl out of this at some point, I would still say that it was a great trade. We yeah. had to do that as an organization. And then once you get, you know, hindsight being 2020 and Pete's now gone after two years and we're now going to go in another direction with a new head coach, Schneider now has control of not just the front office, but, you know, the, the organization as a whole um, below the president, then it made it even better. Like we have so many more options right now today to do that. And I think have a better chance of success than if Russell was still here eating up 35, 40 million a year in salary. Yeah. The Broncos are going to pay him $36 million to not play for them yeah. this year. Uh, and I think they incur $85 million. I saw a stat today that it's not only the biggest dead cap hit any team has ever taken by moving on from a player, Mm -hmm. But it's more than the two largest dead cap hits combined. Ever. Wow! I, I would season. not have. I would not have guessed that. I knew it was the largest. Yeah, and, I didn't and, know it was that big. And the, the really bizarre thing is that, you know, we signed that extension right off the bat, which mm -hmm. it's it's amazing that George Patton is even still employed. But uh, so they make the trade. They give up the house for him, and then they sign him to that big extension, which he hasn't even played under yet. That extension was <laughs> begins yeah. in 2024. Like yeah. the Broncos are literally moving on from him before he even makes a, ever a penny from them on that extension. That's crazy. What, just That's before rough. we before we move back to the Seahawks, like, what do you see ahead for him? Like, do you do you still think there's an opportunity that he can be that he can be a starting quarterback for someone in this league? Absolutely, and I think that you know, there's teams out there that either have young QBs that you know they've given a chance to and just aren't comfortable you know, having them, you know, be their starter with no competition, without a veteran coming in that, you know, potentially can take the job. So that those are the types of teams I'd look for. Um, you know, obviously the Giants come to mind, the Steelers come to mind. Um, I think that there could be fits there potentially, um, especially if Russell has now maybe been humbled a little bit and like, okay, like if you need me to come in and be an organizational guy and do what, is needed for the team to win and to play in an offense, you know, a certain offense, a certain type of way, then I think that obviously helps his chances. Um, no, and he certainly, he kind of did that last year. Like his, his numbers are solid and, and his yeah. touchdown to interception ratio was, was good. And it seemed like he had a couple of real clunkers along the way, but at one point, uh, ironically, during the time where they were trying to get him to change his contract and threatening to bench him, they went, you know, they went on a, you know, five and two or six and one run where he was mm -hmm. playing solid within the system. You, you, it's interesting you say Pittsburgh because that to me seems like a fit. Like they, they did the first round quarterback thing two years mm -hmm. ago with Pickett. It hasn't worked out. I, they just seem like an organization that tends to prefer veterans and, and might be hesitant to dip back into the draft again is their next answer seems like Russ would make a lot of sense there. You know, a team that runs the football really well, still has that identity, physical, kind of like those early Seahawks teams, and obviously has that good defense to go along with it. But well, that's, and, what, that's and again, what makes sense to me. For the for the team that's going to pick him up, they have a huge advantage. Russell's They don't paid. pay him anything. <laughs> so if he, if he truly wants to be there and he wants to leave as much money on the table for them to be a better team at other positions to, you know, hopefully be more successful – then it would really work out, right? Um, yeah. yeah, he gets that thirty-six million no matter what. There's that offset. So, but I do also think you're gonna have to look at the the personality and the cultural aspect, the off the field stuff, because then you start hearing the reports out of Denver when he's doing the you know lunges down the aisle of the plane, <laughs> and then players are like, "Dude, like you're pissing me off." That was so weird. So, so I would make sure that you know you know not only what you're getting, maybe Russell cannot be as Russell with some of that stuff as well. But make sure you know what you're getting and that, you know, you know that that won't be a, a problem, you know, for the team overall. <laughs> like how you put that. I haven't heard anyone say that yet. You know, there, there was the thing when when Peyton got there where he told Russell apparently, you know, stop kissing so many babies. Mm -hmm. Like I like I can see Mike Tomlin looking at him and saying maybe maybe a little less Russell. 
Well, I mean, it's Steeler football. It's it's Pittsburgh. They're you know, I, and that I granted Pittsburgh's made this huge transition, you know, in tech and all that to bring the you know businesses back. And but at heart, they are blue collar. They are you know a team that is going to beat you up on both sides of the ball. Their fan base is not this you know very liberalish you know Denver Seattle sort of fan base that you know that that stuff matters to. I don't think. He's gonna necessarily no, piss people off. They just want to win but, all games. But, it won't, but yeah, but it won't matter to them. Like they will, they won't give a shit. They did like you, Ben did you win or not. Yeah. <laughs> they supported did you, him and yeah, did a, you win or not? You know, like that's what they want. Yeah. So yeah. I would look at those types of teams for him for sure. Yeah. Uh let's talk about the Seahawks. Just you know, you, it's been what, I don't know, six weeks since uh mm-hmm. since the coaching change, and we've all had a chance to kind of wrap our heads around it and and see, you know, Coach McDonald operate a little bit, and 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 mostly see John Schneider operate quite a bit, and be out there, you know, in front and and uh, you know, free to run the organization in the way that he wants to. Mm-hmm. Just what's kind of been the biggest challenge you think in trying to figure out what they might do this offseason? Because we were so used to Pete speak. And, you know, we knew what kind of parameters physically we, we paid a lot of attention to arm length and certain shuttle scores and things like that going in the draft. And we knew a, a type of player that he wanted and, and how conservative he liked to approach things. It's, it's what's, as you try to discern what you think they might do this off season, what's been the hardest part of that? To be honest with you, I, I'm not going to discern anything this off season. I'm going to be a sponge because it's going to be information for future off seasons where we can start to, discern things and be a little more accurate and, and be in the ballpark of what they're going to do. I'm just, I'm sitting back and I'm just watching, like, did Pete share the same things that, or, or did John share the same things that Pete did as far as evaluating players and, you know, certain heights or shuttle times, all the stuff you brought up. Does McDonald have a different view of, you know, the type of players that he, you know, prefers and works best with. Um, and that, and that's the other thing is McDonald actually, he did the thing that you and I both were so angry with Holmgren and Pete at the end of their run is the players are going to fit my system. The system does not change. The players need to fit it. Bottom line, end of story. Well, all of the Ravens players that you know said great things about McDonald and then McDonald himself even said at the, his first presser was he, he catered to our strengths to get the best out of us. And that's how he really built the defensive system that we were in and what we were responsible for doing. And then he even said, like, are you going to run the same defensive scheme that you did in Baltimore? He goes, I don't know if I will, because I don't know the players yet. I got to figure out who I got and what they're good at. And then we're going to go from there. So that's the future of coaching, in my opinion, which excites me about him. But yes, it's going to make this first offseason. We could throw you know, darts at pictures of players and probably be more accurate than us trying to like actually, you know, read into things and figure stuff out is. And so that's why I'm just going to be more of a sponge. I just want to see what they do, how they do it, what free agents they look at, what players they draft, you know, and then hopefully that makes next year just a little easier. Yeah. And it's, you can see why there was the attraction to go with Ryan Grubb as their offensive coordinator because he he speaks the same lang- language. You hear a lot of the same messaging that, and and you see it in, on his resume. You see it in his career that mm-hmm. that he's he's evolved as a play caller depending on what he had available to him. And and he was asked the same thing. You know, you know, what's the running game going to look like? What's a, the the mix going to look like? And how do you how's the scheme going to transfer to the NFL? And he says, I don't know yet. Cause I don't know what we're good at yet. And, and we'll see when we get all the players together. And, and that's, what's been happening over the last week. It's why the coaching staff didn't go to the combine. Cause they have to a get to know each other and, uh, and B install the playbooks and all of that stuff and, and get ready for off season workouts. And, and of course that brings us to the quarterback position, right? We, mm-hmm. I, I almost can't do a show without in some way, shape or form mentioning the quarterback situation it's on everybody's mind even after you know they picked up the option or not the option but they they let you know Gino's salary get guaranteed and then they restructured his deal which increased their dead cap money which makes it a little bit tougher to move on from him and and, and then the Jordan Schultz report the other day that they have informed Gino that 
he's going to be on the roster uh, moving forward. But yet, then they go to the combine, and John and his staff are meeting with Drake May. They met with Jaden Daniels. They met with J.J. McCarthy, right? It's It, it makes you wonder. And I just did a, a show for anyone watching. Go check out yesterday's show. Uh, kind of looking at historically like some what it's cost to move up in certain ranges uh, from the middle of the first round to the top of the first round. Where do you sit today on if you if you had a hunch? And I know you said you're just kind of sitting back and watching, but yeah, what does your gut tell you about what John might do at the quarterback position? My gut says that very, very, very unlikely we move up and get a QB in the first round. If one of the people that they really like were to fall to us at 16, I would not be surprised if they grab a quarterback. I think the most likely option is they look at someone in the later rounds that they really like and they know needs a little bit of time to develop. That's that's what my gut is telling me right now. I would be shocked if no QB is drafted, honestly, because by the Seahawks, right. by the Seahawks, because John's brought it up not only when Pete was here, but now when Pete's gone, that. Hey, like when I was in the Packers, we grab a QB every year. Whether oh, it was he, he won't stop first round or seven. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's telling me that I think on that one, that one thing that if we're trying to figure out the game plan this offseason, that's the only one I would ever give a strong opinion on. I don't I don't know if it's gonna be an early round QB, only because I think with the offensive line and then what potentially McDonald would like to get on the defensive side of the ball that unless literally it was just like, we love this guy. There's no reason he should be sitting here at 16. Then yes, I could see them doing that. I could, but I think it's probably more likely third, fourth, fifth is where I guess they, they would get a QB. So with that said, based on, you know, what you saw in Indianapolis from the guys that throw, did any of those kind of second or third tier guys, sort of stand out to you that made you want to go back and watch more of them and maybe consider them as a guy that could pop later on? Uh, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, I, no one's no one surprised me in a good way, but I'll say with the second tier quarterbacks, none of them disappointed me either at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think now it's more about just watching tape on those guys in general, which is what I'm going to do tomorrow, and just seeing which one I think would be a really good fit for us and has the tools – and the skills to develop into replacing Gino, whether it be 2025 or 2026. Yeah, it's interesting because it's kind of what I use the combine for. And this year, really more than than past years, because with the coaching change, I just, you know, normally by the beginning of March, I would have watched a fair amount of all 22 tape on just about every position. Mm -hmm. But there was so much focus on the coaching search and everything else. And that was where all my energy was that I'm I've, you know, I just posted my top 10 uh, quarterback draft rankings the other day, but there's guys 12, 13, 14, 15 that I, I didn't watch because I didn't yeah. think I needed to. Well, now I, uh, you know, at the combine kind of like the way Devin Leary threw the football, kind of like the way Keaton Slovis threw the football. I'm going to have to go back and watch those guys again, you know? And, yeah. and, and I was looking for that, you know, I mean, I had I had just moved Michael Pratt out of my top ten, and then he goes to the combine and kind of kind of confirms that because I didn't think he had a good combine at all. I didn't think he just he just didn't look like an NFL quarterback throwing the football. Oh, I agree. He did not have a yeah. good combine, but again, he didn't disappoint me because I didn't think he was a good QB going into the combine. So that's why I would say he Fair. disappointed yeah. me. He basically yeah. just confirmed my opinion. That's all. I was a little bit disappointed. I, I wanted to be wowed more by Spencer Rattler. Uh, I had kind of come around on him. You know, we we talked before we hit record about how, you know, the, the hardest thing about evaluating prospects and even people that make a living doing this have to deal with this human nature. It's sometimes you make a snap decision based on the first time you see a player, good or bad. Mm -hmm. and it's hard to change your mind after that. And that's fans do that too. And that's why, yeah. why well, and, you know, and if so, I dare, if I dare mention that I like this guy or that guy, you know, yeah. there's always someone coming at you with he's trash, he's garbage just because they make that decision early on. You can't change their minds. But Rattler, I didn't like at Oklahoma when I saw him play, I didn't think he lived mm -hmm. up to the hype, didn't see it. And he transferred to South Carolina. I kind of didn't pay attention to him. And then I watched some tape because so many people came after me. Like you got to watch Rattler. He's a dude. 
and I could kind of see it. You know, there's something there to like. There's something to work with. He'd be a fun guy to take in the middle rounds. But I, he he didn't. I, maybe I was expecting too much. But I didn't, he he didn't wow me in Indy. Yeah, and, and the guy I struggle with right now about trying to be more open minded is Jaden Daniels. I live in Arizona. I got to see this kid play, and he was soft. He was weak. He he didn't. You know, he was kind of like. Kyler Murray, like if it's not going his way, the wheels come off. But then, and so that was just kind of my opinion. And I, again, I didn't really watch him at LSU um, at all, to be honest. But now, to be fair, I am going to, tomorrow, that's going to be one of the QBs I want to watch. And I want to just watch just the LSU tape and and hopefully be at least somewhat open-minded that if it's there on the tape, that I'll change my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, I, I had to with him too because same thing. You know, I remember him as a true freshman at Arizona State beating the Cougs down there, but he did it with his feet. You know, and it, it kind of reminded me you, if you remember the game early in Byron Leftwich's career where he beat the Seahawks in Tampa and he threw like four touchdowns and he, mm-hmm. he just killed us and, and he looked like something and he wasn't. It was fool's gold. And I just didn't, when he transferred to LSU and that news came out, I thought, that's weird. LSU wants him. I didn't think much of him at all at Arizona State, but he, uh, Brian Kelly, really brought something out of him. So, uh, well, and, and that's the other thing. Like, he has so many comparisons to Kyler outside of the hype. Yeah, because again, when they're on, they they are very good passers. They can be very good passers and make some really great throws. But it's really the feet, and that's the success he had at Arizona State for yeah. the most part was running the ball. So, yeah. And man, he's come so far as a passer. I don't want to, I don't want to taint your, uh, your, I'm going to look tomorrow, 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 but yeah, we'll talk. I'll I'll let you know. We'll talk. Uh, let's talk about the other positions because I think, you know, so much of the focal point has been in, in the trenches and certainly in the front seven, the Seahawks have no linebackers who played any significant snaps last year on a contract for next year. Um, and so that's where a lot of the focus was, what who were some guys that just jumped out at you as you were watching the workouts that like damn I want to get my hands on him? Well, there's uh three offensive linemen and there's two defensive linemen that I really like stood out uh, for different reasons too. So obviously coming out of Washington, and I know I'm gonna butcher his name, but Fuatanu. Um I've heard it pronounced like five different ways, so I don't think you well, can I, I, I hope I hope that was right. Um so <laughs> yeah, you know who you're talking about. As far as the the traditional height they look for for offensive tackles in the league, it's six four and above. He's six three, so he's he's short, but not like six foot. Um, but then when we found out his arm length is thirty four inches, yeah, like that that was a big thing. And so now you have a lot of people, and I even now agree with them that yes, you could still move him inside the guard if that's what your team needed, and. Um, but I could see if there's a team that is looking for a starting offensive tackle that him being six, three now is not going to be an issue. Yeah. So that, that to me was, you know, big, big news. Uh, there was two other guys. So Fuaga, Oregon state. Um, and yeah. what I like, what I like about this guy is that he's ready to go tackle or guard. Like there's two players, him and the kid, uh, the other small kid from BYU, you can plug him in tackle or guard. Now with both of them for our situation specifically, that's very appealing. You know, Abe Lucas is hurt. So we don't know the timeline and, you know, you know, when's he coming back? Can he come back? What it look like if he, Abe does come back? Well, now you got, you know, a backup tackle um, on your roster, but he could also be a starting guard um, along with Suama Ta'aya from BYU. And that's why both of those guys stood out is they can day one be starters as a guard or tackle in the NFL. And that, that, you know, flexibility, you know, that, that, uh, that option for us is really appealing right now, in my opinion, because of the Lucas injury and, and not knowing you know, yeah. how bad is it? Is it something that we're gonna have to worry about moving forward? Nobody knows. I mean, no. yeah, there's just not a lot of news out there other than, yeah, he had surgery. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's and about all we got. 
And Schneider says he hopes they fixed it. it. And I still, I haven't read one single definitive thing with a timeline. You know, is he going to be ready by yeah. training camp? Is he gonna, yep. and, and that's why as I look at the draft, I do tend to just, just like you, uh, I'd love to find a guy that, that has that versatility. And my only question, like to me, Fautanu is, is one of my favorite prospects in this draft. And, and he only, he only enhanced that with his performance. At the comedy he just looks so smooth, which might uh, have taken him off the board at 16. And it, yeah. And because of the tackle question, as you mm -hmm. mentioned, I, he was almost universally just assumed to be moving inside to guard. And now, you know, DJ talked about it on the show and, and, Peter Schrager and all those guys that like team seem as a tackle now. And somebody said during the broadcast, they didn't think they, uh, maybe it was who was down on the field doing the, um, ah, oh, shoot. It was the long time retired offensive lineman that they have. Um, anyway, I'll think of it and just blurt it out later, but that, that he might've solidified himself as a top 10 pick in some team's eyes, which is hard to believe if, you know, four or five quarterbacks end up going that high, but he, he looks like a tackle, which means he might not be there at 16. And then my other question would be, you know, some guys can play the left side and some can play the right. And they talk, Sean O'Hara, that's uh, that's the name he talked about. It. He said, look, I could only play the left side. That's all I could do. I lied to teams, told them I could play the right side, but I couldn't. And um, it, so we don't know. Like, can Anthony Bradford move to the left side? Could, could uh, Fautanu play the right side? Because if he could, my God. Knowing that he could be a dominant, you know, Pro Bowl level guard because he's so nasty in addition to the athletic skills. But also, if Lucas isn't 100, he could be your starting right tackle. I don't, I don't know. That yeah. that'd be really, really enticing. Yeah, he was certainly, um, he was certainly impressive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, D lineman Fisk at a uh, Forest State. Yeah. Now again, hard <laughs> because we don't know the type of player. Right. McDonald. The arms. Likes. Yeah, it's the arm thing again, right? Yeah, right. So I'm saying this without, you know, trying to trying to put, say this is should be without because we don't have the, all the information yet. And then, yeah, I think the Texas kid lived up to his his billing. Oh yeah, Byron Murphy. He's he just, might have been my favorite guy in the whole combine. He was just a beast among men, boys. Really, I mean, it was impressive. Yeah. So and, that that's where I'm at on the lines. For sure. Yeah, I'm with you for sure. And and Fisk is a guy that was so impressive and you watch his tape. It's there too. And the thing that I got excited about is, is uh, Jeremiah was showing some tape of him and he said, look, some teams are going to hate the fact he has sub 32 inch arms, mm -hmm. but he said his, his get off is so quick that he gets into the offensive lineman before they have a chance to take exactly. advantage of the arm length. Exactly. And you know, does that translate? You know, we'll see, but he's, um, he's an exciting dude. Uh, and then it was fun watching the big guy, right? Murphy's college oh. teammate, Tavondre Sweat. And yeah. the, thing that, the thing I loved about him at, first of all, he weighed in at 366 pounds. There were some people concerned because he didn't weigh in at the senior bowl that he might be closer to 370 or 380. Mm -hmm. He weighed in exactly his listed weight. Yep. And it wasn't that, you know, he, he moved like a guy that weighs 366 pounds. It was, I loved the way he attacked everything. Yeah. Like some guys go through those drills as if they, they just kind of have that look on their face and that body language. They don't really want to be there or they're not comfortable doing that. Yeah. Yeah. He just attacked it like yeah. Murphy did too. That's what made Murphy so impressive is he did too, but he nailed it all. Um, yeah. The problem with sweat, I don't spend a lot of time wishing or dreaming for him because I think he's a second round pick all day long. And I just don't see how we're going to add that extra pick. So I agree. Uh, uh, but that kind of leads me into my next question, which would be, you know, we talked about potentially moving up for quarterbacks. You know, Snyder has the long history of moving down. Maybe, maybe that ends up being the goal this year, so they can try to recoup a second round pick. Um, but if you're sticking at 16, from what you've seen so far, um, are there is there a guy or two or three that like you're taking all day long at 16? Well, if if he makes it there, I mean, Fotanu is the lock for me. Like that's the guy. Um. Would you take Murphy at 16? If that's what my head coach, who's maybe our D coordinator, is telling me he needs, yes, I would. I would. Yeah. Some some people don't love the size, but man, I I don't know. I it's it's weird to me how 
sometimes like last year, the, the, all the rage was Kalai Jacansi, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Super undersized. And, and the people that loved Cansey and they came at me all the time would be like, well, Darren Donald, Darren Donald was small. Clyde, you can't see Donald. Well, Murphy's bigger than <laughs> Murphy's bigger than Donald, but yet he doesn't seem to get the same grace. I I've, I've had people challenge me on my desire for that, uh, that pick for sure. Yeah. Do you see any, <laughs> and again, Oh, now what is, what does he think? Is that Raleigh? That's what Raleigh. He's he's definitely on the uh, Fuatanu train. Okay, he wants. He 100%, says, "Hundred yep. percent, Even though he's a, even though he's a husky, we can forgive that. Yep. And right. he's definitely good with Murphy because he's undersized as well. So he's like, "Yeah, <laughs> size don't matter. I'm in the fight." Uh, some of the positions that that we don't generally think are massive needs, right? Skill position, wide receiver. We like the group there. You know, assuming Tyler Lockett comes back, running back. Um, you know, there's certainly some needs at tight end. We don't know what's going to happen there with with everybody, but Disley, a free agent. Um, but were there any guys that jumped out at those positions where you're like, God dang it. I know, I know it's not a need, but I really wouldn't be mad if they took one of those guys. Well, I mean, again, he's not going to be there, but Rome, the wide receiver from Washington. No, I okay. mean, if he's there, I mean, why do we like all the Huskies this year? What's up with that? Hey, they, they had Football a good groups, by the way, if you yes, yes, that we are. Um, you know, I, I mean that worthy guy, the wide receiver from Texas, sure. The, the speed was impressive. So I'm gonna have to watch some more tape, but I don't I don't fall in love with just the speed because that's yeah. straight line speed. It's not running a route. It's He's not so skinny. You know, coming in and out on you know all the things that you need to see on tape. Yeah. Um, Wilson, the linebacker from North Carolina State, not a first rounder, but you know he, he unfortunately he's got the same tag as Penix, the injury history. Now, last year he was completely healthy, mm -hmm. no issues. But I mean, that's going to go down to medical staff. Like, hey, yeah, he fully recovered. The stuff from before is good to go. You know, we're fine. But we don't know that. You know, we don't. Yeah. We don't have that info. Um, he kind of reminds me of. Remember how I, I think we both liked Drew Sanders a lot last year. Yeah, yeah. Um, just long, tall, really athletic, sideline to sideline, fast. The difference is that that you know Sanders was kind of making the conversion. To off ball linebacker, he had been an edge and and they were kind of moving him around. He was he was seen as a hybrid. Like Wilson's yeah. legit an inside linebacker, and yeah, and yeah. that's his nature. And uh, I thought he was really impressive. It, it was interesting that um Griffin Sturgeon mentioned the other day that he kind of ranked his draft linebackers and he said he didn't think Wilson was really a scheme fit for the Seahawks. I found that kind of interesting, especially in light of you know, you know and we'll fit guys <laughs> in, right? But but I do think, man, I think especially if they were to bring back Jordan Brooks, I think he'd be a great compliment if they move Brooks to back to 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 Sam, basically. And mm -hmm. Wilson could just run sideline to sideline and cover guys. Man, he's fast. And if you yeah. watch his tape, like he never stops. He's chasing guys 30 yards. And, and, he, and he takes good angles. I was impressed yeah. at the angles he took. They were very good. The other guy at the linebacker position I thought really stood out to me is Trevin Wallace, a guy that, you know, might be a day two pick might slide lower than that, you know, positional value from some teams with inside linebackers. These, these guys tend to go a little lower and it is a pretty deep group, I think mm -hmm. compared to last year. Um, but he's a guy that really stood out the senior bowl kind of has that size that we haven't seen enough of in the draft the last couple of years, 235 pounds, but tested really well, really athletic hits hard can cover guys. Um, I thought he, he really seemed like a guy that would fit what the Seahawks were doing. Okay. I will say this about the receivers. I I tended to be drawn to guys that I could see as a long-term replacement for Tyler Lockett. And uh Luke McCaffrey is a guy that I've loved since the senior bowl. I just think he looks so fun. And for a guy that hasn't been playing receiver very long, he just looks really dynamic. Um yeah. for all the attention Lad McConkey's getting, you know, McCaffrey kind of looks like a poor man's McConkey to me. But Ricky Pearsall is a guy that um, out of Florida that I'm just yeah. absolutely in love with. I don't think they have any shot at him unless they trade down and pick up a bunch of extra picks because I think you know he's a second rounder all day again. But he just he's so quick and so athletic, and some of the catches he made. I don't know if you've seen that the one hander, kind of the backhanded one that he had. Uh, I, I'll look at. Yeah, I haven't just watched it yet. On, but yeah, that DJ they showed a lot on the. Um, kind of on their recap show, but uh, he just seems like a guy that if there was any way, you know how they always, 
the last couple of years. They keep taking running backs in the second round when when we don't think it's a need. They're not going to do that this year. But I think if if we were to trade back, pick up an extra second round pick, and they took a receiver in the second round, I think a lot of fans would go, what the hell? We don't need a receiver. And then they would see this dude play, and they would go buy his jersey. I agree, and I really like Pierce Hall as well. Um, you know, but it leads into ultimately what what is going to happen with Lockett, right? Yeah, I mean that's that's he sold be... another another big house yesterday. I saw on Instagram, so maybe he's oh, just I did not know that. <laughs> maybe he's going to do so well at uh, real estate. He'll just step aside. Um. Yeah, we don't know. And and that's the other thing. I guess it, let's talk about free agency a little bit before we wrap this up because it's it's one thing I think kind of gets lost at this point of the point of the process. You know, I've I've even kind of stopped doing mock drafts. I'm a little tired of it because we don't we don't know the holes. We try to fill all the holes with our with our perfect mocks that we do in the comfort mm-hmm. of our own home. But they those needs could all change. John Schneider over the years even even when they didn't tend to pay much attention to the top of the free agent market, they he tends to hedge the draft and he tends to fill holes, gaping holes. And, you know, they might go out and address interior offensive line in free agency, right? They might yeah. bring Leonard Williams back and suddenly defensive line really doesn't, you know, how many snaps are there? To yeah. give you a guy if you're going to take him at 16, or or maybe they maybe Tyler Lockett retires, or they move on from. Maybe there is a shocking move. Maybe DK Metcalf is traded when all of a sudden now we're looking at this wide receiver group group that's so deep. Um, as you as you look ahead, you know, 10 days to free agency, uh, have you had a chance to kind of look at the the market a little bit and kind of find a couple of guys that you think realistically this, that might fit that see how you'd like to see the Seahawks go after? Well, I have to go back to uh, the opening statement. In the past regime, I did. But then I kind of had to throw that out because I don't know yeah. <laughs> what these guys are looking for and the type of players that they think they can get the most out of. Um, but what I will say position-wise, I think you're getting at least two, three linebackers, whether it's Brooks and adding some people from other teams, and you're going to get probably two tight ends in free agency. I don't think they're going to go into that draft without some bodies already there and then see what's available in the draft. If you know, they want to go that direction or, or not. Um, I, that that's about as far as I can go because I just, I, yeah. I just don't it's hard. know what they're looking for. No, it's hard. I, I, I tend to agree with you on tight end. I think that, you know, it's an interesting group. It's, it's, um, it's deep. It's not as dynamic as last year. Certainly. Oh, where, no. you could, where you could legitimately get like a starter in the fifth round. Not even close. But, I, you know, I think Disley's going to stay. They're just going to rework his deal. I, I think they like Brady Russell. People keep forgetting about him. They picked him up, you yep. know, and they kind of poached him off the Eagles practice squad at the end of the preseason last year. He's, he's really shown some things on special teams that bode well, and he's he catches the ball well. Mm-hmm. You know, they brought Tyler Mabry back for the 10th time on the, yeah. on the practice <laughs> squad. Right. Uh, and and there are always tight ends available in free agency and they're not expensive. Right? You can find really good value there. So I yeah. think I think you're onto something there and then the rest of it we're just going to see how it goes. I tend to think that we're going to find out about the Lucas thing before the draft because I I think if they want somebody to protect them against Lucas not being healthy um Unless they just they're just 100 percent sold on Stone Forsyth and think he can be the guy, I I think rather than draft someone high in the draft that might be able to play right tackle and invest that kind of resource in them, I'd see them you know signing a George Fant, bringing him back to Seattle, a guy that can play either side in a pinch and, yeah. and can still play some solid football at an inexpensive number at this point in his career, or some lineman we're not even thinking about. It's just a really good, solid guy that, that they can plug in. Sort of like the tackle guard equivalent of what Evan Brown was for them last year, where yeah. they signed him not knowing if he was going to be their starting center or guard, but he, he had history playing both. It didn't cost a lot of money. So I think some of those things will be taken care of in the next two or three weeks. I agree. I agree. And then we'll be able to focus a lot more specifically on you know where they think they might go in the draft. Because I'll tell you what, if a month from now we're sitting here and 
Leonard Williams been resigned. Brooks has been resigned. They've reworked the tight end room. They've signed a couple interior offensive linemen. Suddenly the idea of moving up and giving up resources to get a quarterback would make a lot more sense. Yeah. Today much, I don't see it. Much more palatable for sure. Yeah. Today I don't see it. Yeah. I agree. All right, man. God, this is uh it's been a long time coming. And uh, yeah. I've told people this all the time. Back when I started my podcast in 2018, um, and would have you on all the time. And back then we we had a real hard time keeping shows less than 90 minutes. <laughs> um but uh, you know, we've gotten more mature and concise in our language since then. But uh essentially every phone conversation we've ever had could just be a podcast. Oh, absolutely. And that's you know, what it was. maybe that's what your listeners need to know that yes, I have not been on the podcast in a while, but I mean we talk on the phone at nauseum for sure. Uh, let me ask you this last question, because um, one thing that I, I really like getting insight from you sometimes is is you're down in the Phoenix area and you hear a different narrative. You hear you have a different source, uh, you know, local sports radio down in there has some really cool guys um, given their opinions and they're tied in with different connections and they see things a little bit more objectively and a little bit differently. What's kind of, you know, what are you, what's sort of the buzz that you're hearing down there about what they're saying that they might see out of the Seahawks this offseason? So basically the consensus down here is everyone loves the McDonald hire, all of them. They're like, you know, even if year one is just transition and restructuring the, the roster and, you know, year two is, you know, when you'd see the, the gains on the field and the wins and losses that long-term uh, their opinion is we got the best coach right now in the NFC West. Hmm. Um, they feel like Shanahan's gotten pretty much like Holmgren, like, Hey, you're going to do it the way I tell you. And there's just no other way to do it. And so, you know, eventually that will catch up and then teams figure you out. And, you know, then, then it's your fatal flaw. Um, the same thing with McVay. They think that McVay's not nearly as at the point that Shanahan is, but some of the comments he made the last few off seasons and the fact that he was willing to walk away when the team was in shambles with their payroll and, you know, salary cap, all that stuff. Um, and then, of course, they have no one. They have no one behind Stafford. I mean, the guy's not going to be able to play forever. So, you know, where's that Where's that going to come from at this point? You know, when do they invest the, the draft capital in it? Um, and they do like Gannon down here. They have a prediction there. Yeah. I, but, the, but the problem that they're having with Gannon down here right now is uh, he's not reeled in Kyler and his immature behavior – and You're sure talking him up at the combine, man. He sure sounds like Kyler's his guy. Well, they but they have to, right? The Kingsbury did the same thing, right? Yeah. But then they have to put contract in his language that says you have to prove to us you did this much studying oh, and film work yeah. on your own instead of playing video games. So unfortunately for the Cardinals, they have to try to get the most out of Kyler, and hopefully he, he turns a corner and becomes what they have hoped he would be. Yeah. But I mean, he, his, the, I, I think it, realistically, they can't even cut him for two more seasons without that cap hit just being decimating to their, their budget. Well, and they have so much work to do on defense. I mean, they got to focus oh. on that for a little while too. Uh, here's my quick prediction on, on the Rams is, you know, they, they took Stetson Bennett last year in the fifth round and, and I was kind of high on Bennett, you know, but, but uh, he certainly didn't, look like a future starter in the preseason for whatever that's worth. I think, uh, I just think Bo Nix is such a fit there and, and that I think he's going to slip that far. I don't think he did himself any favors at the combine showing off his arm strength, but I think McVay probably sees him as an absolute fit in his system. And if he's there in that back half of the first round, I, I think they, they take the quarterback. Well, if they, if they do take him and it works out, then good for them. Um, yeah. But again, I mean, they've got aging players on the defensive side of the Unless ball, Seattle takes them first. I don't know. I can see Schneider kind of, kind of like and mix. Maybe, maybe. I don't know. That's what makes this offseason to me so exciting. Yeah. And, and enjoyable is we're going to see a new way, whether it's completely 180 or it's, you know, not as dramatic. It's only a 90 degree, but we're going to see a different direction. Oh, and for I, sure. I mean, John, I, John keeps very, saying. Very excited to see it. John keeps saying, no, no, 
No, I, you know, Pete didn't meddle as much on draft day as some of you think. I, I still ran all that, but we'll see what, you know, and it might take a couple of years, like you said, where we'll go, okay, now we can see the trends. You know, yeah. I do think just to wrap this up, I, I think, and I touched on it on my last show, I don't think there's any way they can find a way to get up there to make it happen. But I absolutely promise you based on everything that every fiber of my being everything i can feel right now that if we walked in to the war room at vmac right now and if they had their whiteboard up that jj mccarthy's at the top of that list i think schneider is going to absolutely love that dude i think he's everything he looks for in a quarterback and it's going to kill him that he can't go up and get him that's that's what i think that's my that's my uh, little hot take i'm going to end on all right I, I see it i definitely see it but I have the opinion that McCarthy might be the guy that slides as well. Sure doesn't sound like it right now. Like it, it's, uh, I read another quote today. Uh, an NFL executive said he thinks quarterbacks are going to go one, two, three, four, and with wow. McCarthy being the fourth guy. Um, and the Cardinals play into that. You know, they hold that fourth pick, and they're going to leverage the crap out of that. And the for best sure. way to do that is for a quarterback, right? For sure. So yeah, yeah. Uh, great to have you on again, buddy. Uh, he's finally on twitter by the way <laughs> years and years and years of passing on i i would send him screenshots of tweets of important information over the years and he finally got on there 602 hawk fan correct yep 602 hawk fan that is eric briggs the uh our seahawks forever arizona correspondent good to talk to you buddy <laughs> you too brother all right man see you soon later well that was fun Always fun talking to Eric. Let me know in the comments, uh, who were your favorite combine performers, first of all? Who do you want to see in a Seahawk uniform? And also, uh, as free agency is quickly approaching, just uh, 11 days away now, who would you like to see the Seahawks go after? And not just in a fantasy world, not like if they had $100 million to burn, but realistically, if you see them signing Christian Wilkins, who the Dolphins announced today they would not be franchise tagging. Well, then you kind of have to figure they can't afford Leonard Williams, right? So along those lines, who's your favorite free agent target? Or maybe a sneaky under the radar one that you'd like to see him go after? And also, who'd you like at the combine that you'd love to see in a Seahawks uniform? Thank you so much for watching. I am Dan Viennes. Until next time, forever and always, go Hawks. <laughs>